So I had planned to do this as my second slide, but I'll use it as my first one at Conrad's prompting. So there's a conference coming up on this topic, and it's actually going to be about microservices, whereas my talk is going to be about lots of things and maybe a little bit about microservices. Sorry to disappoint you. Um, uh, so this is happening in February. We have an absolutely great international lineup of awesome speakers. We're really looking forward to, uh, to that event. I'm actually not speaking, so I can say that. There are only great speakers. Um, so you're thoroughly invited. Um, there's still some tickets left, and it's not expensive, and it's a great two-day conference right here in Berlin, so go there if you're interested in the topic. Okay, with that, I go back to my slide number one, and uh, I'll, I plan to talk about cutting things into pieces. Um, I plan to talk about modularization, and I'm not entirely sure whether I'm talking about microservices or something smaller or something bigger or something completely different. I'd be really interested in finding out. And um, by interested, I mean that I'm absolutely happy if you interrupt me at any point in time. I have no ambition whatsoever to manage to go through all of my slides. Please disagree with me. I love disagreement. I have a loud voice. I can shout you down if necessary. So feel free. <laughs> it's not a problem. Okay. Yeah. So. I want to talk about um, different things, and I've, and I've, um, given, I've given them numbers. The first one is I want to talk about architecture reviews, uh, because this is, this is something that I and my colleagues do quite often. We talk, about, we talk to people about their architecture. They, they have a sort, of, sort of a suspicion that something could be wrong uh, with their architecture because they don't get the results they want to have, so they ask us to take a look. We sometimes do that. And I'm going to spoil that business forever, right? So I'm going to tell you what, is, what the result is going to be of any architecture review, at least of any, tech, any architecture review of uh, a typical system. So generic architecture review results. So what you'll typically find in any system that you look at that has been there for a while is that building stuff takes too long, right? Building features takes ages. That's at least what the people think who want those features, right? It takes way too long to actually get them into the product. At the same time, all of the people developing that thing know that there is something wrong with it, right? We all know about the concept of technical debt, right? We have all of those, all of those times where we made the quick decision instead of the right decision, all of those times where we knew, yeah, we'll fix that in the next release, and we never did, right? All those things just, just pile up and at the end, you have all of those things that are wrong with the system. So everybody knows it, but nobody does anything about it. So the most that happens is that people stand in the water cooler, in US terms, so whatever the analogy is, at the, in the kitchen or having a smoke, and they, and they, they lament how bad things are and, and uh, you know, how stupid the management is, but nobody really does anything about it. Deployment is way too slow and way too complicated and too erroneous. It goes wrong all the time and it takes ages to get something into production, right? Um, it is typically a partially manual process to get something there, which introduces lots of errors and other things, so everybody suffers from that. Typically, those systems started out with a great architecture, right? At some point in time, they were great. Um, that point in time might have been 2002 or something like that, right? So it, it, was, it, was, it was a state-of-the-art architecture back then. It's not state-of-the-art right now. But every system that is successful, that's, that's my personal theory, it, every system that is successful has a bad architecture. That's because every successful system, at least to a certain degree, every successful system uh, gets uh, features added all the time because people like it, right? Somebody uses it and likes it and wants new features, so it keeps growing and growing and growing. Nobody, typically nobody invests time in architecture, which also affects scalability, right? You're at the limit of what you can do with that system, and you have, uh, in general, all of those illity problems, you know, like robustness, uh, you know, maintainability, <laughs> testability, all of those things. You run into all of those problems, um, and that is essentially what you can find everywhere, right? Most importantly, um, the obvious solution, just rebuilding the damn thing, is totally out of the question, right? Nobody would ever be able to pay for that. Replacement is way too expensive. That's the sign of a good system, right? It's grown, it's successful. It also leads to the in innovator's dilemma. Anybody familiar with that? It's the problem that successful companies have, right? They have a product. It's in production. Um, they, it's, it has customers or clients or users. They, they sort of like it, but in the team that develops it wants to modernize the system, but they can't because they start from scratch. And after two years, they've built something that can do 10% of what the old system can do, and nobody wants to have it. So your only, your only chance of success is to start completely in a separate branch. 
all of those things here all of those all of those generic review results are all i think related to, mostly related to to certain elements within an architecture that are tied to the organization so i've i've put up this thing here um, if you look at the if you look at the typical system then the then the badness, you know, the suckiness of the system is directly proportional or the quality inversely proportional to the number of bottlenecks that you have there. Right? There are certain things where, the stu where everything needs to be synchronized, where everybody has to agree on something, where meetings happen. You know, in a good architecture, there are very few meetings necessary. The more meetings you have, the worse your architecture is. And the same is true for, for lots of other things. You have to wait for somebody to, to deploy your stuff. You have to wait for the database admin to to take a look at your ddl because no way you're going to do the ddl yourself right somebody has to do that set all, all of the time and obviously as in any architecture talks talk these days i have to insert a, a conway reference so i think everybody's familiar with conway's law so who, who here hasn't heard of conway's law anybody who hasn't heard of Con okay so conway's law is named after a famous uh, computer scientist called melvin conway who invented the game of life maybe you've heard of that so one of the things that he came up with with was this idea if i if i look at the design of a system it always ref reflects the communication structure of the organization right not not the formal org chart but the actual structure of the communication if people talk to each other and they understand each other and they can work together they can build something that's very cohesive if they don't then they better then they better build two separate things so if you have a team, an organization that has four teams, you'll end up with a system that has four components, which is kind of obvious in hindsight, right? It's not a, but it's an interesting thing. You can observe that in many, many systems in existence. What I find interesting is that you can reverse that law. You can look at it from the other side, right? This says you're constrained to building something that mirrors your organization, but you can also do it the other way around. You can view it like this. If you choose one particular architectural approach, then there are only certain things that you can do with your organization. If you pick an architecture approach that is very centralized, then your only organizational option is a centralized organization. You cannot have independent, flexible, agile teams if they all have to have a meeting with 20 people to get something into production. That just doesn't work that way, right? You have to have that relation between things. Some organizational models will be hard, and others will be easy or possible to implement. And you can reverse it in a different way as well. You can say that if I'm building up a new structure, if I'm building up a new organization, such as in a startup or in a startup that maybe grows or in another kind of organizational unit that starts from a greenfield approach, you can actually choose an architecture to m make a certain kind of organization grow. Right? So if the architecture supports independence, it's far more likely that your organization will have independent parts. If your architecture doesn't, if your architecture requires a centralized decision in certain aspects, it'll be a centralized organization that emerges. It's all, it's all very generic, right? And why am I talking about this? I'll get to that. So it's kind of setting the stage for, for the first part. I find it really interesting. You can see Conway now, uh, this, is a, this is a thing that has been defined in, I think, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, but it's popping up now in every, every talk that I see everywhere, like every architecture talk. 50 years old. Yeah, you might be right. Yes. So it's the first thing I want to talk about. The second thing I want to talk about is boundaries. And I'll use the term system boundaries. I've used these slides lots of times, so maybe you've seen them before, but bear with me for five minutes or so. Um, if you look at system boundaries, an interesting question is to, to talk about how we come up with them. Right? How, who makes the decision that something is a system or that something is two systems? Who, who does that? When does it happen? Right? If you look at this kind of thing, um, you know, some kind of legacy system, then uh, maybe your task is to carve it up into two systems. Right? Have you recognized my serif font old style and non sans serif font it's, it's brilliant so i've carved up the old system into two new systems maybe because of some regulatory reason maybe there's a maybe it's a utility company that needs to be split up into two because they have to separate transport from production or maybe it's an it's a bank that has to separate private investment banking uh, as if that would ever happen so whatever you know some kind of reasonable thing it, that comes from the outside. You could call it modularization, but it's really just splitting apart for some reason, right? So we have two new systems. Or maybe you have two legacy systems. You're a company that bought another company, and now you have two of those, of which you only want to have one. 
So maybe you'll consolidate them into one new system, right? It's like having two policy administration systems, an insurance company, or two web shops in an e-commerce scenario. So the new system uh, appears as a result of consolidation. Most often, though, I think it appears as a modernization approach. Right? You have an existing system, it sucks, so you build a new one. So obviously the new one takes the shape of the old one. And very, very rarely we start from a greenfield approach, right? So you just build a new system. In all of those cases, there is a there is a one-to-one -one mapping between that system and the scope you're in, right? You're a, you're in a certain project. You've been tasked with building this system because that's the project that's been set up to you, which essentially means that a project defines what a system is, which essentially means that the people least qualified to define system boundaries are the ones who define them. Right, somebody who makes a decision about money. That's very unlikely to be a software architect. Right, so somebody has the budget, somebody approves that. And then we start, we as developers or architects start building that system because we're, you know, we're sitting in the room and we start drawing and we never even question that or we didn't use to question that. Right, we happened to build systems just with a certain size because somebody else told us that was the right size. And that's an interesting thing because that is quite obviously wrong. I mean, why would you want to do that? If you look at the size, uh, another old slide of mine, if you look at the size difference, uh, at the mechanisms that you should use at, at, a different, at different sizes of, of systems, then you see that there's a huge difference as the, as the line count increases, right? If I have a, maybe have an, have an effective scripting language, I like, I don't know, Ruby or Python, then I can write a 25 line program and that can do a lot. And I wouldn't start modularizing that into anything. I would just write it down because it's just 25 lines. If, if this, as the system grows, I'll start applying new mechanisms to, to modularize it, right? I'll have a few files and a few functions, or maybe I'll have a library and a class hierarchy. Um, and maybe then I'll have a framework at some point in time. And, it, and then at some, at some point in time, I hit a boundary. Well, now, this is Ruby, right? So if you're Java people, just multiply that by 100 or so. It doesn't really <laughs> matter. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it, I'm not, not trying to, to, to ruin your language for you. It's perfectly fine. Um, there is some size limit, right? You can, you, can, you can say that in Java, I can build b bigger programs. And you're right, which doesn't mean that you necessarily should. But whatever, whatever the limit is, you will hit a boundary at which you no longer are happy with the size of your program. Right? I know, I know Java programs. Um, that have six to seven to eight million lines of code. Now, nobody wants those systems, right? Nobody sets out uh, and says, I want to build a system with eight million lines of code. Because everybody knows that sucks, right? These systems happen. They just grow into this size. So if you were to choose a reasonable size, you'd maybe end up with 100,000 lines or 200, but definitely not 8 million, right? Whatever the boundary is, whatever the language is, it's it very much dependent on the frameworks and applications. But at some point in time, the right choice is to build another system, another application, right? We should have more than one system, more than one application, in, if the scenario is large enough. Right? It's kind of obvious, right? It's not something that, that should surprise any, everyone, anyone. Now, when I say system, in this sense, in this talk, this, that's why I use these slides, they are, they are quite old. I've been saying that for a while. These systems are not necessarily microservices. We'll get to that. These systems, in this, in this view, are just really separate things. Right? They are separate from the rest. And if I talk about the system, I generally mean something that has its own data storage. Right? It has its own way to do that. It has its own logic layer. Um, it has uh, its own implementation strategy. So if I'm building three systems, I might make different decisions, right? I might, I might build one of them using DDD, and I might build another one, I don't know, using a functional approach, which is not exclusive, but whatever, right? I might choose different strategies for each system because every system is a system of its own, right? In this model, every system has its own UI. I'm not yet at that lower service level, right? I'm talking about a completely separate system with a separate UI. It has its separate development and evolution life cycle, right? It, somebody develops that system and adds something to it and deploys it independently of the other ones. Well, not 100% independently. There is, of course, some sort of interaction with other systems, which is fine. But it's limited. It's not the same system. If I, if I have a, I don't know, if I'm a tra in a tra traditional company and I build a system that has a connection to uh, the SAP system, I wouldn't talk about them both being one. 
right? I mean, there are there are still two systems, even though they even though they have a connection. If the c connection is small enough and loosely coupled enough, big words here, then obviously that's still a separate system. It can also be independently deployed and operated, right? Each system is its own unit of operation. It is something that I can use to make decisions on 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 its on my own I, or on in the scope of that particular system that I'm talking about. Now, if I look at that, I can come up with different with different kinds of architecture. Um, I can talk about the whole thing, you know, the 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 decision on on how many boxes I have. Is it five or seven or twenty five? How many systems do I have? That's the first decision that I make. It's sort of my large scale domain architecture. Then I can make a decision about the about the interfaces, right? Do I use web services or Corba or RESTful HTTP or any other technology to connect those things, right? I have a set of assumptions that every single thing has to fulfill. That's my macro architecture. Those two things, this domain architecture and this macro architecture, have got next to nothing to do with the way I implement those systems. Right. So that is, I think, a very key point. I make a decision about how many of those I want to have and how they're connected. I make a decision about how, in general, I connect things. And that it's got nothing to do with whether they're all built in a different programming language. Or maybe whether they all use a different persistence technology. That's an internal decision. It's a micro-architecture decision of each individual system. Right? It doesn't matter how big those blocks are. I think that is the key differentiating factor of, of this approach as opposed to many, many others that we had before. Because when you ask people to draw their architecture, what happens, what sadly happens very often is that you get this generic picture, right? Who hasn't seen this picture? <laughs> Anybody here? So I, I typically draw, draw this on a flip chart and don't put, the, don't put the labels in because everybody knows what I'm talking about anyway. Now, very often you see a project starting this way and people talk about, well, this time we're going to use MongoDB and we're going to use this, this persistence layer that makes it look like a relational database and then we have this messaging stuff and this process support and this whatever, right? They build up a stack of technologies, which is, an in which is interesting work and which also happens to be doable without dealing with the domain people, right? You have to, don't have to understand anything about what it, actu what it actually is that you're building which is why it's such an easy cop-out for people who, who don't want to deal with that, right? So you build that, and then afterwards you put your modules in that. And every module sort of looks the same, right? Because they all follow this architecture. You make this the most important thing. And this is the second most important thing because you only get to it afterwards. Whereas in all of those approaches, whether it's systems or systems or Microsoft or any of the others I'm going to talk about, this is reversed, right? I may have, I have this at the top level. I have the decision of how many things I build at the very top level of my, of my decision uh, a roadmap. And then I may possibly decide to be, build each of those things in the same way, but I don't have to. I can do it, but I don't have to do it. Right? I think nobody is really keen on having everything different on purpose. I mean, that's kind of fun. It's like anarchy, and there's a great talk by a guy, by a guy called Fred George, who will also speak at MicroExchange, by the way, who a while back talked about programmer anarchy, which is a really cool thing if you can afford to do that and let everybody do whatever they like, encourage them to try out new languages and new frameworks all the time. It sounds like a dream job, but you can only do it if you build stuff that only has to last for six months or so. Most of us don't have to do that. So things could be similar, but they don't necessarily have to be. We'll get to some of the reasons why that is a good idea, but maybe one, one, one of my favorite sayings, I'm not really sure now whether it's from Dan North or from James Lewis, is built for replacement and not for reuse. I think that's a very key insight here. If you build those things small enough, then each of those things becomes a possible unit of replacement. Right? You can throw it away and build it again, which is not something that you can do in this model. Right? In this model, you have this single big thing, and you can only modernize those things for all of the modules at once. So I have lots of customers who have exactly this problem. They run a persistence layer that they wrote themselves in 2003. And they have to somehow find a way to get away from that. It's not going to happen anytime soon. And it really gets annoying. Reflect on this point back to Conway's law and word it again. Exactly. Post the same thing on management. Manage for replacement. Manage for replacement. Okay, that's an interesting, interesting thing. Um,
again, there is a. I think there's a, there's a strong there's a strong mapping between organization and architecture. It is a good point, right? If you have something that is too too important, too big to fail, then you have to support it, right? It's like having that big bank that you cannot do away with because everything depends on it. It's become too big. The same is true for systems that become too big. Okay, so let's challenge some assumptions with that. We used to have certain assumptions about the way we build systems, and they are all being challenged right now. We're challenging the idea that a large system has to have a single environment, right? That is something that used to be absolutely the case in all of the systems I was involved with for, uh, you know, the first decade, oh my God, I'm so old, the first decade of my professional career, that was absolutely normal. So we picked the right environment that took months, and then we came up with a system that was built on top of that environment. That was the way you build stuff. This is being challenged. It's being challenged because we have way more flexibility than we used to have in building those individual things. The separation of internal and external things is something that even traditional companies are, are realizing, are finding out, that they, don't, that they can no longer rely on having uh, a one, one department that builds something for the outside world and then some people that build something for the internal IT. So they have to build something that scales to both, right? Which means that we no longer have predictable non-functional requirements. We have to be able to handle to handle effects that we have not, that we were totally unable to predict up front, right? We have to handle different load, for example. We used to have this role model, I'm not going to get into that, but if, if anybody remembers this J2E role model, you know, of different people handling this big, big it's, it never worked in practice anyway, and it's completely, it's completely reversed now. We used to have clear separations and lots of roles, and now we have this single, this idea of this single full stack person that can do everything. It's a complete, it emphasizes a different aspect. Not my topic today. Um, we seem to be able to do away with planned releases. We have customers who are really, really happy to be able to do two releases per year. Right? That's that's amazing for them. And some some have even some even have four. Right? Recently, I talked to a company that had three, and I was really impressed by them having three because I had never heard of that. And they said, "Yeah, us usually we have four, but we missed one. So whatever. <laughs> so typically, whatever. You have planned releases." It only whenever, only when you have that bottleneck, because obviously a planned release requires a release manager and a release management process and coordination and lots of meetings and lots of plans, and you cannot possibly do that 200 times per day. How would you do that, right? You can only you have to you have to count backwards from the release date, and then you can possibly achieve one per month, which is better than three. Um, also, as an aside, it's interesting that systems no longer are built because they have to be, or because everybody has to use them. They're starting to get built because, uh, or in a way that you have to convince people that they want to use it, right? Which is part of the external stuff. If you have to convince people to use it, you cannot rely on the old saying by Adam Bean, which was that um, you can recognize an enterprise system by the fact that its UI is but ugly, right? That used to be true. I think that's changing as well because we no longer have this clear separation. So, this idea of having smaller things is popping up everywhere. And it's not only in the microservices community. For example, this thing is quite old. Has anybody seen this before? The 12 factor of that? It's quite a few people, so they'll probably agree it's, it's worth a look, right? It's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. These are, um, these are uh, recommendations collected by some people who used to work at Heroku. Heroku is a platform as a service solution. Um, built on top of Amazon that gives you a really nice environment to deploy your applications written in various programming languages. And they wrote down these rules <coughs> based on their learnings of how to build good apps for such a scenario. How do you build something that works well in the cloud? And they came up with this idea of having small things, small apps. And these small apps, these smallish things, very explicitly declare the dependencies. They scale horizontally, wherever that might be, the stateless processes here. They expose their services via a port binding. They do something and they, they expose it on port 443 or something else, right? You have no idea what they're built in internally. It doesn't matter, right? They adhere to sort of an outside contract, right? I'm actually saying what's on this slide. So it's separate runnable processes. It's it's a small thing. It's not a big enterprise enterprise application server. It's a small thing that you can start in the Unix command line, right? And you can just as well uh, kill it and restart it. It's accessible via standard protocols, standard protocols that uh, isolate you from the internals. It follows sh the shared nothing model. So there is no assumption that two consecutive requests will hit the same instance. There may be multiple instances, and you have to be able to deal with the fact that multiple requests might hit different ones of them. So it scales horizontally. 
it features very fast startup and recovery. You have to kill minus nine it, you have to be able to kill minus nine and it has to come up in seconds, not minutes. Right? It's going to be a really, really quick, small thing. And you can compare that to the microservices characteristics, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with because you've read that article by Martin Fowler and James Lewis. Um, so microservices share a lot of those ca characteristics, but they're not exactly the same. I'm going to compare three models here. So in that app model that we talked about, we have these small, these small apps. It was the first one. This is sort of the outcome of a discussion that many people had a software architecture workshop, and they came up with the term, mic with the term microservice. And they came up with, uh, with this article that describes this in some detail. So, so some of the things uh, mentioned in this article and, and sort of accepted within the community are that they're very small kind of things, uh, each of them running in its own process. You can see a lot of similarities here. Um, lightweight communication me mechanisms, so it doesn't use an ESB or web services, so whistle style, anything like that. Built around business capabilities, which is my, every fa which is my absolute favorite because it essentially means nothing, but I'm, I'm fine with that. I used to do SOA for a long time, so I'm used to phrases like that. They don't mean anything. Independently deployable is something I like a lot. So uh, similarly to, uh, to apps, they're the unit of deployment, right? They're the smallest thing that you could possibly put into production. Um, there's a minimum centralized management, whatever that minimum may be, and I think that's quite unclear. And they may be written in different languages, and they may use different data store technologies. So again, a lot of similarities here. So compare that stuff to the systems characteristics that I talked about before, and there's some more that I'm going to give you. So um, this is the stuff that I talked about here, right? Um, you can see that there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of similar things going on. And I searched together with my colleagues uh, for a name for this thing for a long time. And we came up with lots of various things, some of them bad and some of them already used somewhere else. And, you know, the name game is always a pretty hard thing because you want to be recognizable and Googleable. And in the end, we didn't really succeed. So what we stuck with was this one. So we call those things self-contained systems, and I'm going to call them that just to, 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 to illustrate the difference between those, between those things. So in this model, the self-contained systems model, which I'm only, tr only telling you about because I want to contrast those three later, with later is, um, is this idea of, this, of those independent systems. And because we now have a, have a term that's less generic than system, I can make up more specific rules. And I say it's an autonomous web application. That's what I'm talking about. It's owned by one team. So a team may own more than one, but any sort such thing is, has a clear ownership by one single team that's responsible for the whole thing. Uh, it doesn't do any synchronous remote calls. It's, I think, a big difference to the other, to at least with the microservices approach. Um, it might have a service API, but it doesn't necessarily have to have a service API because it is a self-contained application that can do its major use cases on its own. It ha obviously has data and logic. Um, it ha doesn't have a shared. Uh, it ha doesn't have a shared UI, so it doesn't share UI components with others. I'll talk about integration maybe later if you're interested. Um, and the only way to share code between two of those autonomous self-contained systems is to use a pull model. So there is no shared shared code base or anything like that. So the only way you can get code from another system is if it's been put somewhere where you can pull it from. So nobody can push something within your system, which I think is a pretty big difference to all of the framework oriented approaches I'm aware of. And now that we have those three things, I can sort of contrast them with, with one another, um, which is really just intended to show you that there is not yet a consensus on what is the right thing. I think I could have done away with the app and the, and the SCS acronym and just said we have a range of various options what a microservice could mean. I decided to do it this way, but it doesn't really matter. It sort of shows the breadth and the various options that you might have. So the first one is size. People always ask, how big is such a thing, right? In this uh, self-contained model that I advocate, um, the, um, the size is pretty big. So these are a 1,000 lines of code, right? So you'd end up with one to maybe 50,000 lines of code. This is a significant application chunk. Whereas in the, uh, in the app model, they typically advocate for something smaller. They don't really say a hard size, but it feels somewhat smaller. It's rather two or three screens, something like that. I'm unsure about what the microservice uh, article authors think, but they seem to tend towards the lower end. I've spoken to both of them, and it's kind of it's unclear. It's not really decided, I think, yet. So that is just size. Size is just one thing. The, the whole idea is that you do one thing that you think belongs within one application. 
right? Uh, the next thing would be state. Uh, where is the state contained? In this SCS approach, the state is part of that thing. So think of that as a web application that has its own database. You don't know anything about that database. It's contained within that thing. Right. In the app, that's very clearly external. They say that this app thing has no state whatsoever. It has a dependency on something that has state. So they have a second model for something that is a shared resource storage thing of some kind. I would say the microservice uh, uh, approach would be self-contained as well, but I may be wrong there. If you think of how many you'd have for a logical system, I think that is the far more interesting question than this one. Right, size varies strongly with the language you use, with the frameworks you use, with the libraries. This, I think, is more interesting because it tells you something about the first level of decomposition of your system, of your whole system. Right, you have this huge thing that you're supposed to do. So, how many units do you have? And I think uh, uh, I'm starting at the right. I think that it's pretty clear that the idea is to really have lots of microservices, lots of them. Um, the app people, I think, are somewhere in the middle, whereas our approach is more towards the we have a few of them. We don't have that many. I think that's a very interesting discussion, and I'm not sure we have an answer yet, because while this is interesting because you have those very small things, and small sounds good because it's easy to understand, this one isn't small. right? So having each one individually small means you have a lot of them. So if you have a lot of them, there's a lot of complexity at that layer push that up one layer and I'm sort of reluctant to accept that that's a good idea even though I'm perfectly aware that there are companies who are very successful with having that many services. Um, I tend to advocate something in the smaller smaller part of although of course it depends on the kind of application that you do. Communication. Um, that's I think a pretty big difference and also an interesting discussion to have. In the SCS model systems are encouraged to not communicate. If they can avoid it, they should not communicate, because if they don't have to communicate at all, at least not synch synchronously, they don't have a coupling at runtime. They can be independently deployed. You don't have to deal with the fact that one of those systems might be gone. I'm unsure about the app model, but I think they tend to do similar things. In the microservices world, that's a wrong term, some of the microservices community, they have this idea of having communicating, cascadingly commuting, uh, communicating microservices that collaborate to deliver a result and I'll get to the composition strategy for that in a second. And then we have the UI aspect. I firmly believe UI should be included in this kind of thing. Uh, the app people seem to, seem to think the same. I'm unsure about the microservice aspect here. I think generally when people hear the term service, they think of something that does not have a UI. Because otherwise, you wouldn't call it a service. So you could say I'm perfectly fine with microservices unless with the exception of the fact that they're micro and services. Other than that, I think they're, they're great. So UI integration, I th I'll, I'm going to talk about that, that f uh, a little bit. Um, I don't see a strategy for UI integration with the others. I think the others tend to not talk about how UIs are integrated. I think that's, I don't see any, any mention of that anywhere. So I'm not trying to sell you on that model. I'm trying to convince you that there is a lot of of discussion still going on, right? Nobody has yet made up their mind on all of that. And this is not tenant because the microservice community has found exactly this way, not at all. All of those things are discussed in this context at various levels. But let me loop back for a second. Why would you want to do such a thing, right? What is the, what is the benefit of the whole thing? Maybe this number should just be one, right? And, and then we will, we will build one self-contained system and be done with it. We don't have any communication over it. Why would you ever end up doing any of that? Right, so I've talked about the problems, a bit about solutions. Let me bring those two together. So why would you do that? I think the key factor is you have isolation. To me, that's the most important part of the whole thing. As soon as you introduce this boundary, whether it's a system or app or service boundary, it doesn't really matter. As soon as you introduce that boundary, it's harder to couple. It's harder to communicate between those things. If I have two, uh, two packages in Java, the protection is negligible. There isn't really any protection, right? I can basically use anything. Okay, I know about private and protected, but you know, I can basically build dependencies in there and I will never be able to, ta ta uh, to tear those two things apart. 
even if I even if I have a rule that says, well, this system, this package does never allow to communicate with this package, I can still end up having them communicate unless I'm very strict about that. I'm very I'm strict in, in checking for that. So iso isolation sort of comes as a benefit of splitting stuff apart and introducing a hard boundary, a hard network system boundary between those things. And I think that's a very, very important, important topic. The next one is the independent scalability. So it's not scalability because there's nothing about splitting a system into parts that makes it more scalable, right? It's only that you have a decision, an option for a decision to scale those individual parts differently. You don't have to scale the whole thing. You don't have to buy a bigger box for everything. Uh, you can in instead have individual parts, um, parts scale differently depending on the load that they actually have to, have to handle. You have localized decisions, right? I think that's very strongly related to the isolation aspect, right? You have the chance to make your decisions within your team that owns one of those things without consulting anyone, everyone else, uh, uh, as long as you maintain the external contract, right? And I think that's another uh, a thing that people uh, see as a big benefit of the whole thing. We already talked about replaceability, right? The idea of being able to um, to replace it if necessary. I think it's, it's not as if I'm advocating that you do that all the time, right? It's just that the option is there, which gives you sort of a good, good warm feeling because you never attach yourself to something too much, which also is related to the idea of this being sort of a playground, right? If, it's, if this is just one of those systems, whether it's five or 20 or 100, if it's just one of those systems, then I can much more likely you something risky because it's just one system and it's well isolated against the rest, right? I can, I can try out Erlang or I can try out Clojure because nobody really cares what I do internally as long as I maintain the external contract. Right? That would be the idea. Now again, I'm not advocating you allow everybody to do anything all the time. This really depends on your existing scenario. So, um, one thing that I've talked about in the past is this idea of having, wh when you're afraid of chaos, of having different rules and guidelines, right? Of having some rules and guidelines that affect your cross-system uh, uh, communication. And in, in Netflix terms, if you're familiar with them, that would be the platform, right? This is what all the services run in, what all the services expect. It's sort of the communication strategy and the patterns and the services and whatever you use to ensure that those individual things can talk to each other. And on the other side, you have those system internal things, right? And the only thing that I'm advocating for is not that you put this there and this there, but this line, right? Make a, make a clear distinction between those things. Because once you mix them up, you run into a bunch of problems. In fact, talking about Netflix, I think that's a great example. I think the Netflix people, uh, so every, everybody, everybody knows Netflix, right? Everybody, can you nod if you know Netflix? Okay. If you shouldn't, you sh should watch some of their talks because they're pretty awesome people. Um, I think they do lots of great things. One thing that I think they did was they cho chose their platform and they let too much of the programming language creep to this level. Right? They have a lot of dependency on the, ja on the Java ecosystem on the left side, which is why they now have to backpedal a bit. So they have this pattern. I forgot, forgot the pattern name. They have this... Ex Does anybody know it? They have this co-hosted thing that ta uses their internal APIs and can use a, a cross-system communication to talk to something written in another programming language. So they now discovered that they do, after all, want to use programming languages that are not JVM-based. And the fact that they've inserted the JVM at this level means that they now suffer from that. So yeah, it, it is an API gateway thing, but it has a different name. I forgot the a si site. A side Sidekick, I think the sidekick is the name. So imagine you had put this all in the JVM, then as soon as you decide two years down the road that you do after all want to write something in Go, then you cannot use your JVM APIs, right? So what they did is they have something that calls the JVM APIs and offers a RESTful HTTP API locally. So you have something that runs on the box and you have whatever, it doesn't really matter. You know. These kinds of things happen if you do that. So the key idea here is that your rules at different levels allow you to communicate, right? So we have system internal rules and cross-system rules, and something built with the cross-system rules of 2015 can still communicate with something built using the cross-system rules built in 2013. That would be the idea, and I'm not going to go into all of that. So one thing that I, that I uh, want to talk about is this idea of putting that stuff back together. By the way, please interrupt me, right? I'm, I, was, I was absolutely serious about this. Please do interrupt me if you...
if you uh, disagree with anything I've said so far. So, we've cut the stuff up into smaller pieces, and obviously we have to find a way to put the stuff back together again, right? Somehow we need to have that stuff communicating. And I, I see a pattern there. I'm not going to talk about all the different options because of the time constraint, but I see a pattern that I find very interesting. And I've seen that pattern happen in, the, in anything that uses the word service. If it's a service layer within an application, if it's service-oriented architecture, or if it's microservice, I always observe the same thing. And what I see is that people think the world is like this. So people think, I have these big, powerful services, and then I just have that little bit of client logic on top of the services that just ties them together. Which I think proves that architects are typically back-end people, right, who vastly underestimate what goes on in a client. So you end up with this idea, but what actually happens is something like this. You have those, you know, you have those stupid services that are basically just a little JDBC wrapper. They don't do anything. They just, you know, they encapsulate a table and make it harder to access and force the join to happen here. Yes? Well, I disagree. I think JavaScript is a perfectly fine programming language, but it's not suited for this task, right? So you might, you might, might see this if, if you observe this within your data center, right? Then it might, you might have stupid services and a powerful client, and this is a fiber optic connection, all is well, and you don't care. But as soon as you put that dumb cloud in here, right? As soon as it is JavaScript, you are going to pay for this decision. <laughs> because now all of the orchestration is happening in the client, which means that you have a ton of remote calls going all over the net. So this is the revenge of the single page app, right? <laughs> it sounded so great, and you found this perfect thing that felt just as good as J2E did back then. It's called Angular, whatever. You, tr you know, you have this. You have this big kind of thing and you do that. So what, what do you do then? What you do is you end up with something like this, right? And you can actually read up. I, I apologize for the graphics. It, it doesn't matter. The, uh, you end up with something like this, which says, I have this orchestration thing, which actually you know, adapts the stuff so that it's usable from the client side, which sort of makes me wonder, weren't these supposed to be the reusable things? I mean, was, was this the idea we started with, that we have this client-specific orchestration kind of thing on top of I'm not really sure of that. This really doesn't make me that happy. What I would like to have is something like this. Now, I've changed the wording a bit, and I've made sure I have business logic here and presentation, presentation logic there. So I'm sort of, instead of talking about client logic, which to me sort of implies orchestration and doing intelligent businessy stuff, I want to have that stuff down here. And I want just presentation logic up there. In fact, this is more of the image that I like to see, at least in my, in my self-contained system approach, because now I have individual applications, each of them offering their own UI, that just happen to be integrated because they all, r because they all run on the web which is sort of a strange idea, right? That we could use the web to do integration. And so I'm going to talk about that very briefly. I think this is one of the vastly underestimated features of the web. It's, it seems that the only people who understand the web are people who do HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I'm not talking about all of them, but maybe just 10% of them. So there's a, there's a sm very small overlap of people who understand architecture and people who understand web technologies. You know, most people who understand web technologies don't, couldn't care less for anything architectural, and most architects have nothing but disrespect for the web, which is really sad because the web is a really cool thing. So when you want to integrate stuff, the task you face is you have your browser with different UIs, right? You want to integrate uh, the browser UI by assembling parts from two different backends. Now, this could be an app or a microservice or a self-contained system. It doesn't matter. You somehow have to grab the UI parts from those two systems and render them into one page. Right? Is that what you have to do? You probably have to do that. Right. So how could we go about that? We could introduce some sort of aggregating server, right? If we're really masochists, we'll pick a portal server. But even if you don't do that, even if you code it yourself, you have the stuff aggregated from multiple backends and pulled together, and put it, which is exactly the picture that I showed, which I don't care much for. Or you could do it the SPA way, right? The SPA way, you just have a single page app that would aggregate all of the stuff here in the on the client side, and we do all of those remote calls, provided you, you understand what uh, 
what the same origin policy is and how to get around it and all of that, that's perfectly a perfectly valid option, which I don't like because it put, puts way too much business logic into the client, which I can never trust to do anything right because it's a client. Right? So I have, this, I have this incredible, absolutely fantastic, innovative solution called a link, right? which means that you have two HTML pages and you go from one HTML page to another HTML page and do away with the idea of, of turning your HTML pages into desktop UIs by aggregating all of the shit into them. So having separate pages means you can have separate backends serve them. And because separate backends do that, you still have to make sure that this looks and feels as if it were one thing. So the way to do that is to um, ensure that you have the same, the same styling and the same topography and the same colors and all of that in the same, in the same place. Right? Well, I think so you have to drill that point. Of course, there's AngularJS and it all doesn't yeah. Yeah, I really think it's uh, it's it's really hard to get around that argument because the choice should not be between Angular and another server-side option. The choice should be between architectural options. Right? I'm not going to go into an Angular rent. Um, the point that I want to make is that if I do it things this way, I really have independent applications. You could draw a line here. This would be sort of like a silo with self-contained system with the links in between. Yes, please. Yes, and you're unhappy with it, or do you like it? Oh, that's a good. It's a good question. Right. So I don't think I have a slide in here, but obviously you have to find a way to not only make things look the same. You also have to make sure that people don't have to sign in again and again. And one way to do that is if this all sits behind the same domain, you'll just share a cookie between between those things. And uh, the way we've, do it, we've done it in projects is to have something like an OAuth token, something that you can use embedded in the cookie that you then unwrap when it hits the server and send back to the client uh, when they log in. Right. So there are various ways of doing that, but of course you have to solve it. You're absolutely right. right. In fact, if you look at applications that do that, for example, Amazon is a good example of that. Yeah, right. If you go to Amazon, you can see if you go to the checkout page, have any of you done that recently? If you don't hit do the one-click option, but if you actually go through the checkout process, you will notice that there is a different, slightly different look and feel. Only slightly, but it's very clearly a different application. You don't notice that, because why would you, right? I think that's the, that's the very interesting way to carve up stuff. Otto has something very similar. Um, and Epos, possibly, I'm not sure about the latest state there. But there are many things, many companies who do that. Groupon would be another example. There are lots of companies who do something similar. And this shows that if you, if you look at integration, you have lots and lots of options between those individual things. Right? And I'll enum enumerate them because I think it's an interesting thing to consider all of them and then to try to come up with a way for you to make a decision about them. So what it says down here is development. Let's say you have two of those independent parts and you have to share something between them. Then sometimes the right way to share something between them is to do that at development time. So at development time, maybe using Git submodules or SVN submodules or something, or Maven artifacts or a, a jar that in contains resources, you will simply share the same thing betwe between two independently developed parts. Now, that is a very static, a very undynamic kind of sharing stuff. But for some things, that's perfectly fine. Let's say, for example, you have a copyright statement at the bottom of your pages. I really don't care that much if it's one hour out of sync and on January 1st. I don't even care if it's three days old, right? Because it's, it's, it's that anyway. So I could share stuff like that here, or maybe your company logo would be something down here. Whereas other stuff might happen at deployment time. At deployment time, you might package some stuff using your automation infrastructure, whatever it is that you have here, or maybe some sort of asset pipeline that combines CSS or JavaScript or image assets into something when you deploy the system. So if you have two systems that have been independently deployed, then if you want to have them both reflect the change, you have to redeploy both of them, which again is more dynamic than this because it doesn't affect development, but less dynamic than the options that I'm going to show you afterwards. Right, so deployment time would be something. Or you could do it at the data layer. So two systems could share some data storage, right? A database that's maybe replicated somehow or a shared file system. So 
uh, they would share this, they would share this data, or you would have two copies that are, uh, are synced sometime. It's more dynamic than deployment, and less dynamic than the next one, which would be a backend call. I think the backend call, which is actually the synchronous call to another system that returns a result, is actually just one of many options. It seems to me that in the microservices world, this, in the, in the REST HTTP variant, seems to be the only option considered. And I think it ha definitely has its place. That's a good choice for the cases where you need this much dynamic uh, behavior. Right? But if you can do this at development time, then it would be totally stupid to do this all the time. Right? Michael Nygaard, which some of you may know, is a great book author, has this great story of a, of a system, an e-commerce an e system that had this typical hierarchical menu you know, that Amazon has as well for all the categories of products. You hit this and it, and it uh, shows you the tree of all the things. Now, that is something that changes occasionally. It changes twice per month. But what this e-commerce retailer did was they recalculated it at every single click. So that means you have a million recalculations of the complete category menu based on, s on some stupid RDBMS abstraction, um, as opposed to just calculating it whenever it changes, right? So you have sometimes less dynamic is a, a great choice. The final option you have, give me one second. The final option you have at the server side is viewing it at the very edge, which means just before you deliver something to the client. At the very, the very last moment before you send something to the client, you aggregate stuff. For example, using something like ESI or some homegrown solution. Conrad. I would argue that uh, this is an architecture decision. If I build a microservice which provides me metadata and caches it in other microservices, we have this whole Well, yes and no. So I. I First of all, I fully agree these are architectural decisions, right? These are options, and within those options, you make a decision on the server side. And you have a lot of things that you can encapsulate within a microservice. So you can say, I do remote call to, to that microservice. I don't care if it stores the stuff in a database or if it pre-calculates it and stores it in a file or if it holds it in memory and sends it back to me. But the one thing you can't get around is that it's going to be a remote call. And a remote call will always be 10,000 times slower than a local method call. Now, that may not matter because you just do it once per minute. So who cares, right? I mean, what's the problem? There's no problem at all. But those things tend to add up, right? If you're in a tight loop, if you're in a scenario where you have lots of calls, this is going to hurt you. So sometimes it's not going to be the right solution. Well, well, okay. Maybe using caching, you can reduce the calls to just uh, happen in 5% of the time. I'm a big fan of caching, right? I'm, I'm, I'm totally addicted to that. But still, a remote call is still 10,000 times slower. And the 5% of the time, you're going to pay for that. Again, it might not matter, right? But I think if you, t if you took this to the extreme and said, well, this is my only integration mechanism, right? Then you would have to turn every class into a microservice. And then I'd be really happy to, s to see what what that turns into, right? So you have to find some sort of granularity that makes sense in ter terms of the cohesion that you have within the service and in terms of the coupling that you have to other services. But let me get to the next... Yes, go ahead. As we are saying, these are architectural choices. Yes. And you're really missing the, the idea of an event bus You are right. You are right. It would be here, and I, you're right, I should add that, because I only, th I only discussed the synchronous call, and the asyn asynchronous call is definitely an option. I sort of have the, the notification stuff here, but you're right, there's an option missing, which is definitely an a, a, a absolutely viable choice for communication between things. So let me get to the next slide and talk about the client side. So these were all just server options, right? Now these are the client options. Let's say you don't integrate on the server. No integration on the server. That's a great thing. If you don't integrate on the server, nobody has to wait for anything to be integrated. Nobody has to suffer from the fact that one service that you depend on is down because you don't care. You just deliver your result. And instead of aggregating the results on the server, you include a link to the UI of the other service. That is great. If you can get by with that, that is perfect. It means that you send the UI to the client, it's rendered the moment the browser receives it, it renders all the links, and only if a client, if a user actually clicks on one of those links, you go to the other place. That's this, you know, magical integration concept that we have on the web. Now, it might not satisfy you because you really, really want to have the shopping cart embedded, right? You don't want to have a link to the shopping cart in the product page, you want the shopping cart. Your shopping cart contains three items worth 300 euros. That's supposed to be within the page, as well as all of the other interesting stuff, like all of the ads and recommendations and all the other fancy stuff that you have there. Another option for doing that is to have that link replaced dynamically. 
So I'm a big fan of something called unobtrusive JavaScript, which means using, using JavaScript for the purpose it's intended for. Um, sorry. So using this way, what you would do is, would be to have JavaScript follow the link, get the result, and embed it in the page. Now, for me as a user, this looks as if you had integrated it on the server, only slightly better, because I don't have to wait for the secondary content, and I don't suffer from a problem if it's not available. Right? If you aggregate the shopping cart on the server, the server offering you the shopping cart has to be there, or you have to handle the error there and render something different. You at least have to wait for it to fail. In this model, the, you show a spinner. You've actually seen that at certain sites. For example, Xing did that for a long time. You have these spinners, right? And then they're replaced by the actual content, which is a very nice option. And of course, you also have the big JavaScript SPA style widget kind of thing, which is also an option. But it's not the only option. Right? That's what I'm trying to say. Similarly to the fact that you don't only have one choice in size and one choice in terms of communication, and one choice of UI, you don't only have one choice in terms of communication. There's not only AngularJS and synchronous calls on the back end. But there are other options as well. And if Angular is great for you, by all means, go ahead and, and use it. Question. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for those not familiar with ESI, ESI is a feature of caches. So a cache has a feature called edge side includes, which means that in your page you in, you uh, you include a sort of a thing that looks like an HTML or an, a piece of XML, which has ESI include something, and then the cache will actually follow that retrieve the page and embed it within your page, which is a very cool feature. And I would l I love to use it for small things, like, for example, the footer. You know, the frame, the outer frame of every page, which maybe is the same on each page. Makes sense. Um, you have to be aware of the limitations, because once you start uh, querying ESI for fragments that contain more ESI fragments and start doing that in parallel, it becomes very, very uh, cumbersome and slow. Because typically things like Varnish do that uh, serially. They don't do that in parallel. So you have to, be, have to be aware of the risks of doing that. And I wouldn't use it as a replacement technology for everything else. I think it has its place for the more static parts of things. I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to use it as a portal strategy. But if you've got good experience, wh why not? So. Um, so let me talk about some of the challenges, some of the challenges of curving up a system. So one of them is organization, right? And this is actually something that I learned in a particular project, which is that if you, if you carve things up into smaller pieces, it's very tempting um, to let them run in parallel because everything's going to be fine, because everybody's now going to do the right thing. But there are certain things, like, for example, the cross-system concerns, which you may have made a first attempt at, but as any first attempt, that's likely to be wrong, right? It's likely it's a first try, but and you did some things right and t some some things wrong, as well as the decision, what the domain model is, right? Is it these five systems or is it seven others, right? Those things are cross-cutting concerns, and they require something like architectural governance, which is a big word to impress your friends. Um, it actually means that somebody has to care about the whole, right? Somebody has to continuously look at that. If you're very good, you might get by with a few people spending an hour a week talking about these things. Or maybe if you're in a bigger scenario, you'll have to have a team that does nothing but consider this, you know, the whole picture, the platform and the actual carving up of the domain into individual parts. Um, so there is a justification for having some of that. The second one is also a learning from, from projects um, that we had which is that um, in terms of operations, you really have to get, you have to get a buy-in from the operations people. Now, that's easiest if what you're doing is DevOps anyway, because there aren't any special operations people except from those who operate the platform, possibly. But if you have those characteristics, you know, all of that stuff, then there is one, which is this one, autonomous deployment operations that absolutely 100% requires cooperation from the ops people, right? Otherwise, you end up with this. You have this wonderful domain, and you carve it up into individual systems or services or apps. It doesn't matter. And then you, you're happy in development because you can develop independently. But as soon as you come down here, right, that magically turns into a monolith because the only way the ops people accept something from you is as a huge, well-tested, 
combined thing. If, sorry? A binary blob, right? If that happens, then, uh, then you really, you know, should, ar should ask yourself whether it was worth the trouble in, in front, right? You really have to get buy-in from everybody, which can be a tough challenge. I was at a customer who wanted to do that, but they, but they practically begged with me not to use the word system anymore. Because if I say system, then that automatically means a certain amount of money. Because each system costs a certain amount of money. If we decide to carve this thing up into 10 systems, we pay 10 times the money <laughs> to the ops because they get paid by a per system that they maintain, which sort of makes even makes sense, right? So you have to be careful about lots of things that you wouldn't consider in the beginning. And from an ops perspe perspective, I sort of understand that, right? Because you're used to bad crap coming from developers if you're an ops person, right? You get this stuff that never really works. So you really have to, f f um, you know, educate those stupid developers to deliver something that makes any sense. And you get to these, don't do this this often. Let's do it just every six months. That's, that's a pain, p that's pain enough. Not more than that. So you have to get buy-in and do that all the way down. So what I just said in, in big letters. Um, and the final one maybe is the, is the talk about migration. Now, um, because that is something that I see people discussing as well, right? You have this system, it's sort of monolithic. Whether you use the word or not, it's sort of not the way you would like it to be. And microservices sound like a great option of, of making that better, right? So how do you go about getting from here to there without developing everything from scratch? Now, in most cases, I would say that such a migration is not a good idea because there are many assumptions that have to hold true for you for that to make any sense. Um, the first one is uh, that thing we're talking about has to have some value, right? It has to have some value to management, has to have a recognized value to people involved. You have to have already a very high cost of change that has to be visible. People have to know the problem. Um, a very slow time to market and a huge backlog of feature requests. I can't imagine any one of you has that, right? But People tend to have that in those slow systems, right? It takes ages to get something out because if you miss, woe to you if you miss the six month release date, then you're waiting for a year for your feature to get into the market. And uh, s simultaneously, you have this huge backlog of, fe of features. You already know if it's prio two, it's never gonna happen, <laughs> right? It's, it sits there, it's gonna sit there forever. And sometimes I really would hate to be a marketing person or a, you know, a, a business person who has to deal with something like that. Um, and you have to have problem awareness. So somebody higher up has to be aware of this, if you're thinking of it, right? So somebody has to recognize these problems as being, as being systematic architectural problems, and you have to get their support. So unless you have all of that, I wouldn't attempt a migration because it's pos probably going to fail. Rather look for a new job or another system to work on within the company. But if you have all that, then something could possibly work, right? Um, there are lots of patterns. As a pattern catalog being uh, created at the moment by uh, my good friend Gernot Starke and a few colleagues. Um, so um, this is one of the approaches that might or might not work. So first of all, you close for changes. Now, ideally, when you do a modernization or migration, you would like to stop the world. Let's just, you know, everybody don't do anything right now. We'll fix, we're fixing things. That's not going how it's going to happen. But for a very, very short time, you can say, I have to do some, some work, which is I have to enable the ingradability. I don't think that's a word, but I put it there anyway, right? Make the system so that it can be integrated with smaller other systems. That might mean that within your system, you have to find a way for external systems to contribute a menu item or to share your login context. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it might suck, but it's just the minimum, minimal amount of work that you have to do because without that, you get a, a break in the user experience and you don't want to have that. So that's the minimal kind of thing. And then you say that everybody who wants a new feature will only get it if we can build it in a new system. No way, we cannot modify the old system. We can, of course, deliver features, but everybody who, has, who wants a feature will have to pay for the development of a new system that supports that feature. In actuality, that might actually turn out to be cheaper than modifying the monolith, right? Because you now have motivated developers who are really keen on getting away from that crap. No, in, in all seriousness, you might end up, you know, building something new, using new technology, lightweight stuff, doesn't suffer from 10 years of legacy. You build a quick feature using some technology, you, you try out something, and then you can integrate it with this thing, right? Or you might copy the bastard 
That's another option, right? You have this thing and you really have to do something within the system, so you copy the whole thing. Now you have two of them, and then you slowly starve the parts that you don't need to death in one of them. Can you imagine how that would work? It's, it's a horrible mess, but it's sometimes the only way you can get at that. Now, once you do that, you integrate it into the whole thing, or you replace the part, and then you repeat. So that is your strategy for migrating from an existing system to a microservices or app-based or a self-contained system-based approach, one with smaller systems. Find a way to integrate them into your existing system and then continue to do that for the foreseeable future. Tough luck. Any questions to that? Otherwise, I'm going to come to my summary slide. Okay, so here's the summary. You can ask questions afterwards anyway. So um, the, first, the first thing I want to leave you with is you have to design your system boundaries explicitly. You can talk about microservices, and that's what you're doing. You can talk about apps, and that's what you're doing. Or talk about self-contained systems. It doesn't really matter. You, you erect the boundaries where you want decisions to stop, where you want decisions to be isolated from the decisions made by others in other parts. Um, you want to modularize, right? I like those self-contained systems. But you might prefer another approach, doesn't really matter. Modularize into, into those things. I think it's very, very important to separate micro and macro architectures. And I see the same thing happening in the microservices space again that happened in the service-oriented architecture space. People conflating the two. Right? The internals of your microservice are an interesting and important part, but discuss that on Tuesdays. On Mondays, you discuss the macro architecture. As soon as you mix them, you'll have stuff leaking from the microarchitecture aspect to the macroarchitecture, and you're going to hate yourself. It's not fun. Don't do that. Right? Leave options open for the microarchitecture, even if you only have one microarchitecture option today. Right? I guarantee that 18 months from now, or three years from now, you'll like something else better. And you don't want to stick to that micro architecture. You cannot afford to migrate everything all the time to newer versions of the perfect microarchitecture that you're thinking of. Okay, so get your, give yourself this freedom to do that. Be aware of the changing quality goals. This is pretty tough. I, I skipped over the slides, but it's pretty hard. If you introduce this approach into a project, people are going to think you're nuts. Because at the beginning of the project, this only costs. Right? It's, it, it wastes effort. It seems totally unreasonable. It seems like total over-engineering. It seems like architecture astronauts at work. So you really have to be convincing and somehow get people to, to understand that you're doing some of the stuff that you really do now because you think it's going to have a long-term positive effect. Obviously, you have to strike a balance between control and decentralization, right? You want to have people... That's one of the key goals, right? That's why I started with Conway. You want to have people independent. You want to have people isolated from each other to a large degree. But some stuff needs to be done centrally, right? Some stuff you want to manage and some stuff you want to technically concentrate at runtime. You have to think of that and introduce it into the whole thing. And that's all I have, unless you might have a question. Anybody with a question? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I'm not. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping that I'm advocating. I'm advocating that one system should be built by one team. One team can build more than one system. That's fine. But for every system, I want to be able to go to a single place and have the people who are able to make all the decisions for that particular system. I think that's the key thing, right? You have a, you have a unity between the organizational unit and the, and the architectural unit, which allows you to get quick decisions in that part. You can iterate very quickly. You get, can all, in, if you're in a, dev, in a DevOps scenario, the perfect model would be to have that team see direct input from, from production, right? They see the monitoring logs of the actual production service. They are able to put stuff into production. They are able to make decisions about the features that, are going, that go into that system. They can watch the, the heat map of users visiting their part of the website and decide to rearrange buttons, right? So in my view, that will be the perfect 100% full stack team that can, everything, that can do everything within that part. And I think that's efficiency, right? That's what you want. It's actually the Amazon model. And Amazon has this rule of uh, you have no team larger than what you can feed with two pizzas. So this is American pizzas, not the, not the German <laughs> one. But you know, big pizzas, that maybe means seven to eight people, 
and that's sort of the limit, right? That's I think is a reasonable limit for a for a good team size. Did I answer your question or get around it somehow? Right, excellent question. Yes, I don't have a good stock answer to that. Yes, those are all good ideas. Rotating people, having regular meetups, having one team show, uh, show off to the others what great stuff they did, have common open source projects that they, could, they can collaborate upon. So at, uh, at Otto, one of the great ideas, I think, was to say, um, if there's, I don't know whether they actually, maybe Johannes can tell us whether they actually managed to do that, but th one of the ideas was if you want to share code between two teams, the way to do that is via, gi via a GitHub open source project. I love that approach, right? That's a great idea. You have, and Netflix sort of does the similar thing, right? You, you sort of try to get people to collabor collaborate with the world as opposed to just with themselves. And that's, uh, I think, a benefit for everyone. Right. Yes, please. Yes. What, what would the argument well, this you know, this having 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 teams for the individual layers is the best way to ensure your project is late. It's probably the best argument because they will have. I mean, the the, the synchronization effort between those people is going to be uh, crazy, right? It's like it's it's just I I'm I'm a strong very strong believer in feature teams. I've always been a believer in that even before all of this discussion, right? I think it's very important to have the people together. And I think it even violates uh, accepted management wisdom to do something like that. You you know, if you pick up some arbitrary management book from the Amazon bestsellers, it'll tell you the same thing. You have cross-functional teams, you have a uh, knowledge shared, you have people who can So, yes, if you do that then it's a problem. In fact, I've seen that as uh, as one of the core mistakes of SOA in many big companies because they because when people started SOA nobody nobody knew what it what it was. I'm not sure people know today, but back then in the beginning nobody knew what it was. So they started to use existing patterns and applied them everywhere. So they um, applied them across the whole company and suddenly the whole company had a data layer, which is the worst idea that you can possibly have, right? So Johannes Management that is able to learn and understand and listen to developers or architects. Which old for that? Sorry. So, yeah, maybe the realistic answer to that, to that would be um, become a manager. It's a good answer. I like that. Doesn't solve the problems. Okay. It's actually, I think it's, uh, it's already happening to a certain degree, right? I'm old, so I used to talk to different people. I used to, when I started my career, I talked to people who always wore a suit and who didn't understand a single thing about computers. Right, and nowadays managers look like Johannes. I mean, the world has really has changed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different way. So maybe one last question, and then we should have pizza. I have just a remark. Johannes yeah. will make a talk about this topic. So yeah. <laughs> if I, I can convince you, we find out. Yes, please. How do you manage if you have several teams and uh, the service side uh, depending on each other? How, how do you synchronize it? Or, uh, ways, or, uh, right. Or so yes. So there are many many ways to synchronize work between teams. So I, I still maintain that the best possible way is to try to not have those dependencies, or at least minimize them as much as possible. If you have them, one of the ways that's been that's being advocated, I've seen work in practice, is to have what's called consumer driven contracts, which essentially means that the the team that actually or the teams that use your service um, contribute tests to you. So but if I use your service, I give you a test that you can run on your site or, in your, you, or with you locally to ensure that my client will still work. Um, th the, the one thing that I'm not so happy about is that that requires us to agree on a running a runtime environment for those tests, which sort of violates some of the assumptions. But uh, it's been known to work, and it's also, it's actually, if you Google that, Consumer Driven Contracts, it's from a paper by Ian Robinson that he wrote about seven or eight years ago in the SOA context. 
So you can see much of the stuff that was written in the SOA uh, at times is now cool again, which is kind of funny. Because it was so uncool, like, it was incredible. <coughs> yes, okay, last one. Um, <coughs> Like a new feature of an existing service, or if it's like a new feature or a new service. So where do you make the boundaries? How do you like guide your yeah. making this decision? That's a, that's a brilliant question. I think it's at the core of every architectural decision, right? I don't think I can have an answer, a stock answer for that. It absolutely depends on your on your uh, uh, judgment of the individual situation. Is it easier to incorporate into something existing? Is it easier to build something new? It's really hard to say. I would advocate for. In general, you know, uh, in general, apply the, the open close principle. You know, one of one of the solid principles, which says, if every I want to design my system so that every new feature I have becomes a new piece of code, as opposed to a modification of existing pieces of code. But it's really hard in the, because then my system is open for modification, uh, closed for modification, but open for extension. If I can build my system that way, then life is good. The problem is, I only learn what the perfect system is while I'm making mistakes building it so you have to sort of find out what the thing is that people want to add and then over over the course of time your structure will adapt to that but i think we're all hungry it was great talking to all of you and i'm here for a while so have a have a good evening thanks